Welcome to In It to Win It. This is Steve Barton, and thank you for tuning in. We are back with our resident uranium expert, Justin Hewn of Uranium Insider. Justin, thank you for coming back on the show. Good to be back, Steve. How are you? I am just capital, sir. Just capital. <laughs> Excited. Talking uranium, one of our favorite subjects. <laughs> got a lot of listener questions here. How about you? How you been? Yeah, I've been well. I've been well. Just got the the November newsletter out this morning. So yesterday was a was a was a grind. So it always the day the letter goes out, it always feels like oh, I can take a little breath. And yeah, so I'm I'm feeling good today. Happy to happy to be on with you. Good, good. Uh, we are as well, sir. Uh, okay, um, we're gonna get right into it here. Um, and uh, we've got some, uh, you know, same as uh, last time, we've got new uh, uh, subscribers, new listeners, uh, a lot of new people into the uh, uranium space. And so maybe we'll start out a little bit uh, kind of high level, 30,000 foot view like we did last time. Uh, Bar Red wants to know, what countries are the biggest producers of uranium? Well, the, the number one country by far is Kazakhstan. So in 2022, Kazakhstan uh, on 100% basis. So the main operator in Kazakhstan is Kazatomprom. They are 25% uh, publicly listed and then mostly private and owned by the sovereign wealth fund of the state of Kazakhstan. Um, but they have a joint ventures with a bunch of companies and a bunch of private entities. So uh, a couple of Japanese entities, some Chinese entities, a lot of joint ventures, I think six joint ventures with the Russians, um, and then with Cameco and Arano as well. And then they have a bunch of mines that are not joint ventures. But on a 100% basis, Kazakhstan produced 43% of the world's production of uranium in 2022. By far the biggest producing country. I believe the next runner-up is Canada. And that's primarily the, the Cameco and Arano joint ventures with Cigar Lake and MacArthur River, very large mines. Australia is up there. Niger is up there. Uzbekistan is gaining steam. They produce somewhere between 8 and 10 million pounds a year right now. They're trying to increase that production to about 18 million pounds per year by 2030. And then the, it just trickles off from there. But Kazakhstan by far, Canada uh, runner up. And then I think it's Australia after that. Okay. So Kazakhstan has almost half uh, at 43%. Then Canada, Australia, Niger, and then the Uzbeks. Oh, I'm forgetting about Namibia. Namibia is a, a decent sized producer as well with Rossing and Husab, which are both Chinese owned mines and are currently operating somewhere a little bit under, I think, uh, 18 million pounds a year, roughly coming from Namibia. Okay. All right. And uh, I'm going to add this, but uh, on the flip side, what countries are the biggest consumers? Uh, so who has the, has the most nuclear power plants and who eats up most of this stuff? The United States is the largest consumer currently. They consume about 40 to 45 million pounds a year of uranium equivalent. Uh, they have 92, 93 gigawatts of nuclear currently. Um, so U.S. is the largest. I believe the second largest right now is still France with 70% uh, of their grid as nuclear. The Chinese, I think, are just about to lap France and are expected to lap the United States by the end of the decade. So within the next six, seven years, China will be the largest consumer of uranium. And then I don't think anybody's going to catch them for a very long time. Okay. So the U S eats up 40 to fit 40 to 45 million pounds a year, which is probably about 25% of the planet's demand. Right. Although we don't, we don't make any of this stuff. <laughs> we just consume it. Exactly. Uh, and then France is uh, shortly after that. And China is going to, going to take the lead here uh, by the end of the decade. Yep. All right. Um, okay, G-Man wants to know, is a decoupling of uranium stocks from the overall market possible? Is it is that possibility already evidenced by money managers' capital entering into the uranium sector? Um, yeah, I would say so. Uh, if we actually, you can actually chart, you know, URA or URNM against the broad market. Against I'll pull the that up right now. Sure. And, uh, and then we can see right here. So this is URNM versus, uh, we'll just take the SPY, the SPX. And since its inception down here um, around, uh, what year was that? Uh, like 2020, something like it was, that? It was, uh, yeah, they, they, they started out just a, a couple of months before kind of the COVID lows. It was December of 2019, I think, is when they IPO'd. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, and and so right here we can see basically the way we read this is when this is going down, uh, the S and P five hundred is outperforming um, URNM, and when this is going up, URNM is outperforming uh, S and P five hundred. So we can see the gradual trend line here is basically yeah. up. Yeah, and if you if you click on the left side of that screen, Steve, you see that little ruler. Yeah, click on that, and then click kind of where they IPO'd. Okay. And then drag the mouse up after you click once oh, and that. click where it's at now. And you can see the outperformance, 164% since their IPO, uh, URNM compared to the S&P. And then on your watch list down at the bottom there, URA compared to the SPX, and you can zoom out and yeah. see a much longer term perspective at the very bottom of your watch list there, URA. Uh, yeah. Ratio against SPX. Not, oh, there, there it is. All right, I'm still learning this program. Yeah, <laughs> okay. and then at the top of, at the top of the screen where it says daily, click weekly or monthly. Weekly. Then you can, okay, you can... yeah. So here, this is uh, <laughs> Fukushima time right here. Yes, and uh, just drastically underperforming the uh, S and P five hundred. And then if we zoom in on the graph here, around the same time of uh, twenty twenty or so, URA is finally starting to outperform uh you are in m let me do this little ruler trick you just taught me right here and we'll hit that to that 96 percent yep and you are m typically has a bit more leverage because it's 100 percent uranium miners whereas ura is 70 percent uranium miners okay awesome. yeah but i love that i love that ratio chart ura compared to the s p because it really kind of uh really shows you potentially how early we are and how, how little we've moved even though there's been some pretty gigantic runs in the past few years. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. I, I love that new software, by the way, that is pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, just to add one anecdote to that question, um, certainly we speak with, uh, with industry analysts and money managers, and there's absolutely evidence of increasing interest from generalist funds into the sector. Um, so obviously you can look at the chart and see that, yes, these, these equities have generally performed outperformed the S and P over a multi-year timeframe. But uh, there, there is clear evidence of money rotating. How much it will rotate, how quickly, in what kind of volumes, that's all speculation. But um, so far, it is happening and money is rotating. We'd obviously like to see that happen a lot more going forward because certainly there's pretty much universal broad market fears uh, in general kind of equities investing fears currently right now. So, uh, but yeah, it's happening. Yeah. And just to put it in perspective, too, I did the math on this a couple of weeks ago, uh, but the, the market cap of the of, of uranium and uranium equities and everything is so small. It's one one thousandth of the S&P 500. So it does, it's not going to take a whole lot of, of money coming into the sector to really move it. Um, you know, it's a very, very small market. And that's one of the reasons why it's so volatile like that. But, uh, but generally speaking, it is it is rotating in. So. The answer, I think, is now. <laughs> All right. Uh, Parrot Capital wants to know, uranium has seen a sustained rally for a while now. So he's talking about the run-up we've had in the last couple of months. What could potentially slow it down in the near term, even if the mid to long-term thesis remains bullish? And he adds a disclosure there. He's long, uh, spud. Um, what, I'm sorry. Could you, could you just repeat that one, Steve? My apologies. Yeah. Uh, what could potentially slow it down? So what could what could slow down uh, the uranium uh, oh, okay. full run in the near term, even though we believe in the long term it's going up? I mean, really, the only thing that I think is going to slow it down would come from the demand side, because I really don't see any supply side uh, kind of relief valves in the near term. Um, so it certainly there's uh, utilities always have some inventory. They never just draw it down to nothing. So the investors are always trying to uh, speculate on when we're going to have that panic moment where there's no uranium ever available and the utilities are just absolutely screwed. It's like, well, I don't think we're going to see that point. I hope we actually don't see that point because you want the industry to be able to function. Really, you know, you don't want to have, oh, there's no uranium left, so we got to shut reactors down. Like, we don't want to get to that point. Um, but with that said, you know, there's certainly a possibility that you know and this is kind of my most likely bear case which i still think is less is not very likely which is you know governments not doing the right thing and life extending their existing fleet you know doing what germany has done so if we see more premature shutdowns 
which by the way, there are zero on the table right now. Um, I just attended the NEI conference last week in Charlotte, North Carolina. And at the beginning of the conference, the um, the NEI director, Nima, was basically saying, you know, in years past, they have a table of shame at this conference where they have uh, current and, prema- and upcoming premature reactor closures. He's like, that table isn't here this year because there aren't any. Uh, so that's how much sentiment has shifted. But, you know, some kind of change in demand is certainly a, a possibility to at least see a stagnation in price. But, you know, it, it's hard to tell you the equities are a different story. The equities are are equities. So they tend to get washed around with general equity sentiment sometimes. Um, so it's much more difficult to predict that. As far as the price of uranium goes, I, I really don't know what could move that price down in a significant manner. We're going to have periods where the price overshoots and based on, you know, a kind of near-term sentiment getting a little bit hot. Like we just had, the price ran from 55 to 73 in like less than two months. And then we had a pullback and it pulled back from 73 to 69 and stayed there for a couple of days. And we're already back up higher to 74 and a half. So the signals in the physical market are not telling me that we're about to see a washout in the price of physical. What the equities are going to do, I have less insight into that. But what physical is going to do, I think it's going to remain very tight. And we're going to see increasing number of RFPs come in for uh, not only for spot, but primarily for term market tenders. That's coming. That's happening now. Hard to say what what's what slows it down, other than some change in demand from some uh, some market signal that I, I can't foresee at the moment. Okay, so the biggest short term risk you see is probably the same one we do: is that uh, politicians <laughs> don't do the right thing and they they choose uh, coal over. Yeah. Uh, nuclear. I mean, I mean, look, I'll, I'll give you one very short example here in the United States, the Palisades reactor that was shut down last year. Um, recently, Holtec, which is the owner of the plant and has been uh, uh, contracted with the re- responsibility of tearing down the plant, decommissioning it, filed with the with the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission here in the United States to actually bring the plant back online. There's state funding to bring the pa- plant back online. However, there's been a public comment period over the last month or so, and a, a number of quote unquote environmentalists that are in surrounding communities have come out, you know, uh, staunchly opposing the plant restarting. So whole tech is now, it's not necessarily going to stop it from restarting. I don't know, but you know, these sort of things happen where you have local communities potentially against the, the extension of a plant or, or the restart of the plant. Life extensions are a little bit less because they don't have to go into a public comment period or anything like that. But you know, it's always possible that these sort of things, this sentiment shifts away and we see some demand destruction. That's entirely possible. As of right now, I don't see any evidence of that. The evidence is exactly opposite. So it's hard to say really what slows down the price movement. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, you just mentioned the uh, conference you just got back from. Um, Cuppy went to the uh, uh, WNA conference in London, uh, what was that, a month or two ago. And it was his article and interviews were pretty interesting in that basically he came back from that feeling like um, Michael Burry from the big short, you know, that that, uh, you know, these these fuel buyers have no idea of, of, you know, like we do as investors of the whole supply demand dynamic. You know, did you get that same impression uh, or, um, you know, what uh, what what was your summarization of uh, uh, the NEI um, conference you just got back from? I think that there's, I definitely had an experience that was similar, although I wouldn't quite say as drastic. Um, I think that there was a bit more of investor, uh, let's say, attendance of the WNA than there was at NEI. NEI was much more industry focused and much more centered. You know, all of the US utilities were there. And then there were some foreign utilities, a lot of fuel cycle participants. Uh, representatives from Centris and GLE and Arano and Converdine. Uh, they were all there. And then a handful of company representatives on the mining side. Um, but yeah, I would say, you know, really wanted to kind of gauge where we're at in this investment by attending this conference. And and mostly, you know, I'm, I'm trying desperately to poke holes in the thesis and figure out, okay, especially where is the supply going to come from? that's going to stem this tide. And I came away with no answers whatsoever on that front. Um, I don't 
the, you know, that's exactly opposite. The supply supply side is the biggest concern. And this was echoed throughout the conference, both in private conversations and in presentations, is there's a there's a severe shortage of skilled labor and there's supply chain problems across the board. And so um, supply remains fragile. And uh, yeah, as far as the utilities go, you know, they from an investment standpoint, we look at this market and we try to figure out exactly what is going on in supply and demand, as you would in any commodities, you know, long or short thesis. You want to know what's the demand for this commodity, what's the supply, where are inventories, the people that consume it, what are they doing? So what is the supply? 140, 145 million pounds this year. What's the demand? 180, 185 million pounds, probably more based on tails assays. Um, what's the secondary supply? 15 million pounds. Okay. So we're still 25 to 45 million pounds short this year. Yeah. Okay. What are the people that consume it doing right now? They're buying uranium. Um, utilities don't have to do that. It's not their responsibility to have supply and demand modeling. None of them are doing this. Um, they buy uranium when they have to buy uranium. So they have their own cycles for their plants that they operate that have 18 to 24 month refueling cycles where a third of the core will be replaced with fresh fuel. And they have a very short period of time where they, the nuclear plant is offline to make that fuel exchange. And they know the fuel cycle takes this amount of time. So they buy their enrichment, they buy their conversion, and then they buy your, their uranium and have it run through the fuel cycle. Two years later, Bob's your uncle. They've got fuel to put in the reactor. So they're thinking three, four, five, six, seven years out in front and we're thinking, oh, because Adam Prom just released this, this thing saying, hey, we're going to shoot for this production increase. And then people start selling their stocks. It's like so absurd. But the utilities have no responsibility to time the market. That's not their job. They're not looking at supply and demand modeling, generally speaking. So they buy when they need to buy. And they cannot have a nuclear power plant without fuel. So if it's 75 bucks a pound, they'll pay it. If it's $30 a pound, they'll pay it. If it's $150 a pound, they'll pay it. So... Yeah, the utilities, I would say, aren't in a panic. They're not necessarily concerned about the price, but they are noticing the price. And they are noticing, like the pullback I just mentioned, we had an enormous run in the spot price, a 30% run in about six weeks. And it pulled back for about 10 days, $4. And then it went right back up. And went right back up during the conference. And so, uh, yeah, they're noticing it. The market is very, very tight. It's catching the utilities uh, attention for sure. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, Cuppy did an interview with the guy that, uh, I'm, his name's escaping me at the moment, but he'd been going to the WNA for years. And, uh, he basically said that, you know, he, he was asking these, these utility buyers, like, do you get any incentive for front loading this, you know, and seeing that the price is going to go up and, you know, let me just snag five years of supply here and then I'll get a bonus because I just saved my boss, you know, millions of dollars. And they looked at him like he had two heads and, and, and they were offended like he wanted to see their paycheck or something, you know, and, you know, they just don't think like we do, you know what I no. mean? Like, like we can see the landslide of money that is coming into this sector and we're front running it. And they have no interest in that or, or even desire or, or there, there's no bonus for, for picking that up. Like, it's so strange to me. Yeah, no, there's not. Um, you know, they, they have their budgets and their budgets are, you know, kind of uh, uh, set out for the year on an annual basis. And those budgets will be based around the fuel needs of the plant and the active prices in the market. So uh, whatever the price is and whatever their needs are, that kind of dictates the budget. And in most cases, those increased uh, budgetary expenditures for nuclear fuel can be passed on to the rate payers, but still, you know, the nuclear fuel costs for an operating power plant on average are about 15% of the overall operating budget. And uranium is, a, is you know, 20, 25% of that 15%. So three, four, 5% of the total operating budget is uranium itself. So that can, that can double and triple. And it's still, I mean, it moves the needle, but it's not a, a, a it's not a game changer. It's not, it's not a deal breaker for that plant. They have to operate. You can't have a 10, $15 billion asset that's supposed to operate for 60 or 80 years and say, oh, oops, uranium went up a little bit. So sorry, guys, no electricity. <laughs> like, that's just not how it works. But um, I mean, so there, there's one fuel buyer that I've spoken with who uh, used to be with a smaller, a smaller utility that had a single uh, nuclear power plant that they operated. And and he had a lot more flexibility because it was such a small operation. 
and he had plenty of communication with the investing folks. And of course, the like you know, like you and I both know, you know, myself, uh, a few others, especially the funds, like the guys from Segra and the guys from Sachem Cove, they've they've put in you know fifteen twenty thousand hours into this thesis. They're managing hundreds of millions of dollars, big responsibility. Um, so they know exactly what's going on supply and demand front. Exactly. They know every single power plant is laid out on a spreadsheet and how much uranium they're going to be buying, when it's supposed to shut down, will it get life extended or not, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're a fuel buyer and you can talk to these guys, which he did, then you see, okay, prices are probably heading higher. So he he was kind of a first mover and, and made sure that his plant was covered and his plant's covered you know, for the next decade and at much lower prices than we're at now. And he's no longer with that company, but he's at a far larger, uh, more lucrative position currently. And part of the reason is because he did act early and did do and, you know, made an incredible move for that plant because of his foresight. But there's risk in speculating on price, right? So if you if you stick your neck out there as a fuel buyer and convince management, hey, we got to do this now because prices are headed higher and then something happens and prices head lower, then you look like an idiot. So there's really not an incentive. You know you have to buy and you're going to buy when you need to buy, not when necessarily prices are low. With all of that said, we're in a clear uptrend. When the price drops a little bit, we're going to see demand kick in. And we saw that after a $4 drop. So these, these intracycle kind of uh, you know oscillations are kind of getting tighter right now. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. Uh, on to Sput. Uh, okay, so what is the SPROT criteria for buying uranium at SPOT? So this is a little bit of a black box, but um, our understanding essentially is that they're going to try to maintain a cash position of somewhere around 1% of NAV. So right now that's maybe $40, $45 million, which is exactly where they're at right now in cash. Uh, they raise cash when the trust is trading at a premium to NAV, a premium to the previous day's closing net asset value, which is published daily on their website. So if they trade it at a premium to that, they can issue shares into the open market via their ATM, raise cash, buy uranium. Generally speaking, they don't want to chase uranium higher and force it higher. Their criteria is to purchase as uh, for as near-term settlement as possible. To date, I don't believe they've gone out past a 90-day settlement. In fact, I think most of their settlement has been within 60 days and oftentimes even within 30 days. But of course, it's the spot market. So technically, they have some leniency. If they, if they want to buy pounds, they got the cash to do it. Um, then they want near-term settlement, but nothing's available. They have the option to go out a little bit further on the curve. But as of yet, they haven't really done that. With that said, they don't want to hold a ton of cash and not buy uranium with that cash. And generally speaking, they haven't done that because then they'll have a little bit of a nav drag. So if the price moves a lot relative to where they raised, then they'll have a bit of a, a drag on their net asset value. And so they tend to buy uranium relatively quickly after they've raised cash, assuming they have that 1% of nav buffer in cash. Uh, but besides that, you know, I, I think things have shifted a little bit for the trust. Uh, especially considering the tightness of the physical market. I don't think what they want to do now is come in and raise 50 to 100 million in the single day and slam the spot market. I think that the heavy lifting has been done by Sprott. And now they're going to be kind of like a buyer on the margins, possibly helping to kind of set a floor in the spot market. And there's a number of buyers on the margin that are kind of working to set a floor, not just financials, uh, producers as well. So that that's what I think the role is going forward. And uh, hopefully... They will apply for that physical redemption mechanism and it will be approved. We've been talking about that for a number of months since they released it before WNA. But as of yet, I don't believe they've actually even filed the application for it, but hopefully they will because I think it'll keep the trust trading very close to NAV. Okay. Okay. So they, they try to keep about 1% of their uh, allocation into cash. And then as soon as it goes to a premium, then that's when they try to fire and buy. Yes, yes. And as far as keeping cash at 1% of NAV, you know, that's basically what we've been told. Of course, prior to this latest spate of raising that they did last month, you know, they drew it down to less than $10 million. And they were like, yeah, we don't want to do that again. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, they've got they've got fees, they've got overhead. Um, so, and if the market is kind of risk off and they're at a discount for a long period of time, then they're kind of in a, in a tight spot. But 
I, I don't think they're going to draw it down much further than here until they can raise again. Okay. Okay. Yeah. They're the Cameco and these other places are not storing this stuff for free. They, uh, they, they got to pay for exactly. it. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Um, all right. And let's see during, uh, Dustin Garrow interview on Crux Investor, he mentions U.S. utilities will take notice when the big boys, and he says like Constellation Energy, Duke Energy, start contracting. Do you know if they've started contracting? Well, Duke and Constellation are two very large utilities. Duke operates 11 reactors in the United States. Constellation operates, I think it's like 19 or 20 20 reactors, maybe even more. And they're about 20% of the US nuclear fleet is, is operated by Constellation. So these guys generally are better covered than the rest of the US utilities. Uh, they're very, very, very smart, very forward looking. So um, it's not like, when are they going to start contracting? You know, they're kind of always contracting. But um, if they come into the market with a very large tender that goes out uh, uh, you know, further into the future, that's going to get the attention of the market. So um, without really, and, and they keep a kind of a tight lid on this stuff. So it's not really public knowledge exactly how far out they're covered and how much contracting they're doing. There's a lot of NDAs surrounding this stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that they'll get, get the industry attention, especially in the United States. If let's say they come out with multi-million uh, pounds per year, deliveries with uh, any given producer going out to like 2035, 2040, that's going to get the attention of, of the rest of the industry. Um, but as far as like being sh near and midterm covered, they're covered. Uh, that's my understanding. Okay. Okay. So between the two of them, they've got over 30 nuclear power plants and they're, they're covered in the short to midterm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, oh, going back to Sput. Uh, David Turner wants to know, will a big producer or a consortium of utilities have to take out one of the financial entities like Sput or Yellowcake to cover the looming supply deficit before new greenfield developments can be brought online? Um, I'm going to say no. I, I, I don't really see that happening. Uh, I think that, that uh, again, the investing community seems to kind of want this uh, you know, uranium Armageddon, where there's just nothing left at all. And we don't need that. And we don't want that. Um, the price is going to be going considerably higher, even without something like that happening. So I don't really see that happening. Um, you know, like I said, utilities, generally speaking, have a bit of inventory. I, I think things could get dire in like a two or three year time period. So but as of now, I'm going to say that I, I don't really see that happening as of now. Um, things could, certainly could change over that time period, but probably not. Okay. If something like that did happen, then they would simply, if uranium's going for 120 bucks a pound, we as spot shareholders could sell it to them for 130 and make a nice profit or something, right? It's true, um, but they don't have that mechanism. Uh, it, it would need a shareholder vote for them to just sell pounds back into the open market. They don't have that yet. So um, I think that this physical redemption mechanism, assuming that they apply for it and it gets approved, is kind of the answer to that. Because then what it enables is utilities to actually buy trust units and redeem for physical. Um, they won't be able to do it all the time. I think it'll have limitations as far as how often they can do it. And only uh, industry participants like utilities and traders will actually be able to redeem for physical. But that will address the concern of the industry of Sprott sitting on 60 something million pounds of uranium in a, in a pretty severe supply deficit, but you know, anybody can buy it. It's it's in the utilities could have bought more in the years past. So I don't want to say, you know, screw you guys, but uh, that physical redemption mechanism for Sprott, hopefully that happens because it'll keep them close to nav, but it'll also address that concern. It's like, you guys can have our uranium, just buy a bunch of trust units and you can redeem it once in a while. And that that will that will solve that. It's hard for me to believe that you'll have a majority shareholder vote to approve Sprott selling pounds in the market because shareholders will understand what that selling pressure could do to the price. Yeah, <laughs> make it go down a lot. <laughs> yeah. Unless they engage exclusively in long term contracts, and that's that's something different, right? Because that's if the demand is sufficient. You know, it's I mean, it's crazy to even say this, but I never thought somebody, of that. Yeah, somebody we could, that's we could sitting say, hey, on it's available to you two years from now at this price or something, huh? 
Yeah, yeah. You know, it's I mean, it's just like Cameco. They're not spot market sellers. So they increase their production. All they're doing is building out their contract book and it doesn't really put any selling pressure in the spot market at all. So, you know, but yeah, like I said, it's, it's kind of crazy to say it, but I don't even think that Sprott being able to sell their uranium would put a drastic amount of selling pressure on the price of uranium. And that's, you know, 60 something million pounds, but it's not about to happen anyways, would take a shareholder vote. Um, who knows how this plays out? I, I really, I really don't know exactly how it plays out. But as of now, if you talk to Sprott, they're saying, no, we're not going to be selling uranium ever. Um, but perhaps we'll do this redemption mechanism. And I think that's a great middle ground. Okay. All right. Uh, kind of piggybacking on this. We seem to always get this question. Uh, is there any fear of a government could force Sput or other trusts to partially sell their holdings, citing uranium as a critical metal? No, I, I mean, I don't fear that personally. Okay. All right. Neither do we. Um, all right. Uh, Wally Morris wants to know, uh, since uranium companies actively promote their ESG compliance, often promoted as a moral issue, um, then should uranium companies consider the moral issues involved in selling to the Chinese? You know, I, I think I think the ESG issue is is such a slippery slope. It's 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 so easy to find some sort of non-compliance according to the very vague ESG metrics that all of these corporations apparently seem to be uh, aspiring to achieve. So I don't really know how to answer that. I mean, I would have thought that there would have been more shareholder and possibly even utility response to the announcement earlier this year that Kazatomprom had made a new deal with Russia. Um, I mean, regardless of how anybody feels about that, it's clearly, you know, the West is against what's happening in Ukraine. And I'm very surprised that there was not more fallout for that company, to be completely honest. So clearly, the industry players that are still dealing with Kazatomprom don't really give a damn about that particular ESG metric. Um, you can fault, you can fault China on various human rights violations, environmental violations, et cetera. I think that their their overall ESG score is probably pretty darn low. But, you know, it's it's not really for me to say what utilities should or should be doing. Um, I, I They should have been buying a lot more five years ago, and they didn't. And uh, they should be supporting, U.S. utilities should be supporting U.S. miners, period. Um, some of them are. Um, there's a lot of shoulds, but uh, it's it's not really my place to say what they should or should not be doing. But his point makes sense. If if you're a utility and you're pounding the table about your your low carbon green score and your ESG and you're doing this that and the next thing for uh, for your employees, but you're also lobbying United States Congress to not not sanction Russian uranium, you know that's that's pretty um, that's a pretty big juxtaposition in terms of your ethics in your moral code. So good point, Wally. I don't have a great answer for that, but uh, yeah, I see your point. Yeah. As a, uh, cause Adam prompt shareholder, I, I think they should be able to sell it to whoever they please. <laughs> sure. I'm, I'm very biased. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is, it is still technically, you know, an open marketplace, but uh, to his point, you know, if you don't want to support an entity that's supporting Russia, and that's where you stand, then you probably don't want to be buying pounds from them. Yeah. And same thing goes with China, you know, that, but it is a, the, the nuclear, the nuclear fuel cycle and the nuclear world is very, very small. And that's something I really felt at NEI. Like this is, there's 200 people there and there was like a one big family. Everybody knows each other from around the world. They're all on a first name basis. It's, it's a very small world. So I think that in a lot of ways, you know, the industry understands that the environmental degradation and the human rights violations that are happening in China, those are not being perpetrated by the people that are building nuclear power plants or buying and selling uranium. You know, and same thing goes for Russia. It's like Rosatom, Uranium One, they're making deals with with Kazakhstan. They're not the ones, you know, firing rockets into Kiev. You know, it's like 
they, they still want to play on this global stage and be seen as, you know, reliable providers and, and buyers of this material and of these fuel cycle services and products. They're not necessarily the ones perpetrating this. And so does it make sense for them to be associated with the nation states that are doing terrible things? I don't know. Probably not. Okay. Piggybacking on the Chinese, Andrew wants to know, how many pounds have the Chinese secured with their deals with Kazatomprom? This is a tough calculation because they're not going to tell us. And uh, the only thing that we're going to be able to do is look at their um, year-end financials, maybe in February for 2023, and try to glean some information from that. But with that said, a, a special shareholder vote has to happen for a contract that on balance between Kazatomprom and the entity signing the contract will equal 50% or up to 200% of the overall book value of Kazatomprom itself. So that would be about $2.6 billion would be the low end, the 50% of their book value. Um, but it's not just this one contract. So let's say it's CGN that's signing this contract with Kazatomprom. They already have certainly a number of contracts on the books for future delivery with Kazatomprom. So this addition of this new contract will put them over that 50% and up to 200% of that book value of Kazatomprom. So it's hard to put it an exact number on without knowing exactly how much they have already contracted with Kazatomprom, but um, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> so I mean, I mean, you can take 2.6 billion and divide it by 75 bucks a pound, right? And what is that? 30 million pounds or something like that. Um, cumulatively, so let's say they've got deliveries for the next 10 years and they already have a chunk of contracts and this addition to that puts them over that limit. And this is the second time it's already happened and I believe it, it very well could be possibly two different Chinese entities that are doing this. But um, the takeaway is more pounds coming from Kazakhstan in Kazakhstan in general are going to China, period. China and Russia are going to be consuming the bulk of the pounds out of this country um, for the foreseeable future. Okay. Um, Elder Catch wants to know, uh, when will the death of the near midterm, uh, uh, spot be basically, uh, you know what, maybe we can back up just a little bit. Uh, can you go over what a, uh, request for proposal is? Sure. So there's a couple of ways that a utility or even a trader can go about procuring uranium. And one is to have off market discussions with producers straight up. So if you're a utility, you can actually pick up the phone and call Cameco and say, hey guys, we're looking for 2028 to 2033, 500,000 pounds a year. Uh, give me your numbers, right? So you can just straight up call producers directly. That's considered an off market discussion. An on market request, market tender or an RFP, a request for proposal is basically saying, I need these pounds for this delivery in this form. And sometimes they'll say, oftentimes RFPs will say, we need a million pounds of U308 equivalent in any form. So they'll take it in U308, they'll take it in UF6, they'll take it in EUP. Sometimes it's specifically for just EUP, but it'll have a U308 equivalent number. Um, but we're seeing a lot more RFPs come out for U308 specifically, which means the utilities that are seeking uh, U308 delivery already have conversion and enrichment covered, which we know that most of them do. So the demand is coming to uranium, but basically they'll just put it out into the public market and, and then they'll have offers come to them from various producers. Okay, okay. And uh, piggybacking on that, uh, so when will the death of the near midterm spot be? So right now we're seeing overwhelming volume is going in to the term market, uh, you know, basically. Uh, we need this in 2026, right? Not we need this off the spot market now. Um, that That's kind of already happening, right? Sure. I, I guess I don't exactly understand the question. The death of the near midterm spot? Yeah. Uh, so a few RFPs get passed by and then they get no offers. What do they get partially filled? I think basically he's saying mm -hmm. like, um, you know, it, it, in, in the future, are we only going to have the term market and no longer the spot market? Probably not. Okay. I mean, I think that there's always going to be some uranium for sale in the spot market because there's, there's, you know, there's traders that have off takes that are long-term agreements where they'll, they'll have a certain amount of pounds coming on a monthly basis that, that they can sell into the spot market. You're going to have 
producers, especially near-term developers that will be producers in the next few years that are only going to be producing a million pounds a year, million and a half pounds a year. They're not going to be tying that up in contracts most likely. So if you're like boss, then you're going to be producing something from honeymoon, you know, in the next six or eight months, that's just going to be sold in the spot market most likely. Same thing with US, UEC, you know, uh, Encore and Global Atomic, for example, they they have some contracts, but they still have a decent amount of capacity in the future for selling straight into the spot market. So there's going to be some spot availability kind of always. So it's not like it's this static bucket of pounds that once it's gone, it's gone. But the spot market is just dictated by the term of settlement you know, less than 12 months settlement equals a spot market transaction, you know, so 11 and a half months is spot, 12 and a half months is term. It's like, it's not really, and, and they could be basically identical tenders. Uh, they're just going to be different categorized based on that period of time for settlement. Oh, um, I didn't know that. Okay. So there is a timetable on it. So less than, uh, yep. it's kind of, I guess, kind of like a, a treasury versus a bond, right? A treasury is uh, less than uh, 12 months. A bond is, uh, is more than 12. Okay. All right. 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 So, so yeah. So, I mean, all things considered, it's sort of one big market, but it's the term of settlement that dictates whether it's a spot or a term, uh, a term transaction. Um, with that said, there's definitely been kind of a, I would say a trend that we've seen in the past year where an unexpected RFP will come into the market that has come from a utility that's dealing with a life extension or an unexpected demand. So earlier this year, that was PG&E. They put out a very large RFP for Diablo Canyon, which got a five-year life extension in California. And that triggered a little bit of a shakeup in the market. Didn't move the price a lot, moved it a couple of dollars at the time, but it was pretty chunky, four point something million pounds over a five-year period. And then um, more recently, the Koreans have come in with a pretty large RFP. And as you know, Korea has done a 180 on nuclear in the last couple of years. So with their new administration, they had, they had a nuclear power plant that was under construction that got halted, I think back in 2018. And the new administration has restarted construction of that plant. And now they're in the market buying fuel for that plant that's still under construction. So these, these life extensions or, or restarts have immediate market demand. And the large RFP for short-term delivery, as far as the industry goes, it's somewhat of a sloppy way of operating, right? So, because it just shows like, you're not thinking here. You're not, you're not, you're not thinking out of the future very much to have your, have yourself covered. Now in the case of PG&E, they didn't know, right? It's California. Yeah. They expected they were going to be shutting the doors. <laughs> so, <laughs> but to just go like, just come out and publicly in the market and say, Hey guys, we need a hell of a lot of uranium next year. It's like, ugh, come on, man. So so the industry in the case, and specifically with PG and E's RFP, it's, I think it was kind of interesting was if you're a producer or a trader, you sort of, you don't want to ignore the RFP because you want to, you want to signal to utilities that you do have something available and you want to support the operation of the industry, but you also want, don't want to jump at the chance and say, Hey, we got this. So oftentimes these RFPs will, will, will come from multiple sources. Like they'll split it up, take part from this entity, part from that entity. But, um, you know, what we also notice is the RFPs that are in the market are taking a very long time to, to make decisions on the offers. Um, probably because the offers are uh, higher than what the RFPs are, are hoping for. And, uh, yeah, it's, um, the market is very tight. The floors and ceilings continue to rise. And uh, yeah, I don't know what else to say about that. The price of uranium is going up. It is. That's that's what we're saying. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see. Wrapping up here. Uh, Calif wants to know uh, any updates on Niger. Are they are they still having trouble getting uh, drill bits and uh, uh, what what do you call this stuff? Lixiviant and 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 all that stuff. Has any Agents. of that ironed itself out, or are we still <laughs> still in the waiting game? There hasn't been a lot of clear information that we've been able to get recently, other than comments coming from um, a representative from Murano at NEI. So, and that was actually in contrast to what we're hearing from, for example, Global Atomic. So Global Atomic is saying they've been able to get some material in the country. 
um, Arano is saying they have not been able to import reagents for since the coup. And so, uh, so this is for like leaching the ore, leaching the milled ore. So they have an operation in Niger called Somer. They shut down Common Act last year, the year before, but Somer is in operation, has been for decades. They've been operating the country for 50 years. And the Irano rep said they're shutting, they're closing Somer in November um, until they can import reagents again. So uh, it's looking like they won't be getting uranium from Niger soon. And that's a, you know, it's a pretty big deal because that's never happened to them before in 50 years of operating in the country. So uh, yeah, it's, it's not looking like it's drastically improving. Yeah. It okay. doesn't look like it's necessarily getting worse, but certainly goods flowing in and out of the country is still limited. Yeah. It's tough to cross the border when you have to run through a bunch of guns. Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. All righty. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Justin. Uh, there was uh, um, anything you want to wrap up with your um, uh, there'll be a link to your newsletter down below. We had a lot of questions come in about company specifics. If you want to find out about those, click on the link below and go to Justin's newsletter and you can find out all about them. Justin, what can we expect if uh, we sign up for your newsletter? Well, we just put out a 45 page letter that just went out today. Um, we we put a lot of time into the physical market and understanding the physical market because I think it's the most important thing to understand um, in a commodities investment is where is the price going to go? Uh, so uh, spoiler alert, it's going higher. Um, but included in the membership is, is a monthly letter like the one we put out today. We do monthly webinars. We have a really awesome guest for this month's webinar, which is happening next week. Haven't announced that guest yet. Um, super looking forward to that conversation. We do uh, we do actionable email bulletins whenever there's market moving or company moving news. And I do an almost daily video update that covers the, the movements of the market that day, do some brief technical analysis and share any stories that are worth sharing in terms of uh, what came across our desk that day or the day before. So basically we just live, eat and breathe this sector and uh, spend a lot of time on covering the physical market, maintaining our communications and our connections with the industry um, participants. And yeah, it's it's a it's a good time to be had by all. Yes, yes. I'm so glad we found this sector. And if you're new to it, uh, you're probably, uh, I don't know, in the third or fourth inning or so, we still got a ways to go. So congratulations, well done, you found it. Uh, and welcome to the club. Justin, thank you very much again for coming on the show and thank you for tuning in. Support the show, hit the like, subscribe, and share this with anyone that you think needs to hear it. You have yourself a great rest of the day and we will talk to you next time.